going to go on and I'm going to hand it over to our guest speakers. Um, they're going to really quickly, not really quickly, as long as you all want, uh, introduce themselves, where they work, and uh, a little overview of their professional path to where they are today. So we'll go on and whoever would like to hit it off can get started. Um, I'm Crystal Barnes. I work here at Midway University in the marketing department. I'm just temporarily housed out of LRC. Um, I handle all of the digital media assets for the university, so the digital signs, social media, the website, um, any mass email communications, all of the admissions emails, all of that sort of stuff runs through my desk. Um, my path to Midway started out, uh, I went to Berea College. And then I worked a few random, no-nonsense jobs just to earn a paycheck. Um, I started doing marketing outside of the college level um, at a nonprofit in Lexington Bluegrass Green Source, which is an environmental education nonprofit, so I helped them expand their audience. Uh, and then I worked in automotive, helping sell uh, BMWs, Volkswagens, and Hondas. I was there for the entire Volkswagen scandal. <laughs> and uh, then I came over here to meet my name is Brad Kirkhoff. I'm a twice graduate of Midway, 1985, preschool, and then 2012 for my MBA. Not used to seeing this many guys in the room when I was here in 2012. There weren't that many years, so it's neat to see how it's changed here. Um, I'm vice president of sales for a company called Seco Environmental, and uh, we're about a $500 million company. And I work very closely with our marketing team, and I live in my city, Texas. I'm Stephanie Arnold. I'm the marketing and member services director for a tourism entity called is it horse country? So if you're familiar with the Bourbon Trail locally, um, our organization was started about eight years ago with that same model in mind of the local equine attractions, primarily thoroughbred farms, <coughs> clinics, that sort of thing. So I started two years ago. Um, we actually, the organization was started eight years ago, but we actually started doing tours about three years ago. So we're still a pretty young organization. So marketing right now means everything, we're doing everything every day, anything that needs to get done. Um, so we're a membership organization, so the farms and clinics are members, we have about 39 of them. So there's a component of my job that is a lot of marketing to those folks, and then our consumer-based marketing, where we're trying to get people to buy tickets and can take tours of our location. Um, I'm a graduate of the University of Kentucky. Go Cats! Or is anyone streaming the game? Oh, well. um, uh, and, but I live in Lexington. I did 10 years in Nashville, which was a really great experience. Had some interesting and diverse jobs while I was there that all sort of went back to marketing. Um, but it's good to be home and to be back and to be working in an industry where I get to promote the Commonwealth. And just to help you guys out, all of these are students that are in our sports management major. So any sports references you make will make sense to them and they'll be able to follow those along. And then from the sales and marketing side, um, any job you take in sports, you're going to be selling something. You're going to be marketing something. Getting a job, you're going to be marketing yourself. Any professional sports organization, the first two jobs you're going to have, well, in addition to cleaning toilets, will be <coughs> selling ads that go above the toilets. So being able to sell is a critically important component of any successful sports career, whether you're working in sport of equine or whether you're working in and Professor Benson's case, you run a gym and do personal training, or, or what I did working for the national governing body for a sport and selling to members, clubs, coaches, and facilities. So we organized this to give you guys a little insight as to what sports and marketing careers and marketing and sales careers look like. We have some um, questions. Some of our guests have asked some questions. Um, to ask the panelists, so feel free. Um, you might have any questions. Are you all accepted in engineering? We do, but we're we're accepting mechanical, electrical, and uh, environmental engineers. We are bringing them into our sales program, so we're hiring a bunch of engineers, making them take that engineering mindset and let them sell. So it's kind of restricted to that right now. We have a work study position on campus um, that is taken next year, but over the following year. We are accepting interns, and um, to date, we've had one intern per semester. Um, the other bit of information about our, our organization is that we're not for profit. So we have seen interns who want the not for profit experience, who want equine experience, who want marketing experience, operations, guest service. 
Um, so we have a really broad need for our intern program. Um, and yes, we're accepting them. We, our spring intern will be done this May. <coughs> and we're always looking for folks who are interested in learning about what we're doing. Yes. Uh, what would be your number one piece of advice for students? In the career world, um, make a decision. You know, as quickly as you can. Gather data. Spend the time doing the research and uh, make decisions. Because a lot of times you don't know which way to go, and, and people choose not to make a decision because they don't know the answer. They're afraid to fail. Gather the data. Get the, get the intelligent people around you. Make a quick decision. I make ten a day, and I hope eight are good. But not making not making a decision is a decision. Uh, so I would just say move things forward, and gather the data, and make decisions quickly. I would say don't be afraid to speak up. Even if you're the most junior person there, sometimes the idea that you bring to the table is the thing that's going to change the entire game. Um, and just because things have been done that way for five years, ten years, twenty years, doesn't mean that it's the right way and that it can't change. Uh, I would say you've just got to do the work. You've got to show up. You've got to answer emails. You've got to return phone calls. Um, even the hard stuff, even the uninteresting stuff, sometimes you have to do that to get to the fun and interesting stuff. Um, I feel like we're in a little bit of a hustle culture right now, which I observe and struggle with a little bit. And I think that there's maybe an impression that things just happen and that jobs will just appear, or if you have a cute enough or well curated enough social media following, then things just happen to you. But the truth of it is, in the professional world, you still have to show up and you have to be dependable and you have to be reliable and show up for people. What's the hardest part of y'all's job? <laughs> leading people that don't work for me, getting them to do things. You know, you have cross-functional teams, and, and you know, people in your organization, you know, nobody has to do anything, but they pretty much need to do what you, you tell them to do. But when you have other people, other sides of the house that you need to work with, uh, plant side, whatever that might be, getting them to, to buy into what you need them to do when they don't have to, and influencing them, you know, emotional intelligence, finding ways to motivate them and get them a line deal. That, that's that's where you succeed the most, but it's the hardest thing to do. Also, I think I think one of my challenges right now in this role is um, seeing nothing but potential for worst country and seeing what enormous strides the bourbon industry has made with welcoming guests and being in sort of agritourism and knowing that there's great potential for what we're doing um, and sharing the story of the farms and the care that the horses get and and the business and the economic impact that our industry has. Um, and it feels like we have just barely, barely cracked the surface. And so I think one of the big challenges right now, the hardest part of the job, is just seeing all that potential and trying to make those decisions and committing to something and speaking up and finding ways to kind of keep that moving forward because um, there's so much we can be doing. The biggest challenge in marketing, I would say, is making a mountain out of molehill, which is essentially your job. Um, somebody comes to you and they say, I need a flyer or I need a communications plan. And they don't know what they want, and they don't know what they need, and sometimes they have a half-brained idea. And you have to take the tiniest bit of information and build this whole wealth of assets for them. Um, so your job is to problem solve, you know, figuring out, well, if, if they have this goal, here's the ten ways we can meet that, and here's four of them that are actually going to be effective. If someone were to follow in your footsteps, what should they do to start off if they started today? Diversify. Study all sorts of different things. I have an English degree, but I do uh, graphic design. I do web design. I know HTML um, and CSS, and and that's been really important to my ability to move up in the marketing world. Uh, being able to do more than one thing, you can be a jack of trades, but a master of none, and that's going to take you really far. I'd say learn everything you can at the lowest level of the organization, and then as you move up, you understand. With your strategy, whether or not it can be implemented. But if you just know your job and you're just looking to, to move up and you're not networking with those around you, uh, you won't really know when you get to a higher level what can actually be implemented. You'll have this great PowerPoint slide and it'll look wonderful. It'll be a graph and show this growth. Then the implementation will destroy you because you don't actually know what, what these people do or how it gets done. So spend your time, whether you start that organization or you go to a new organization. Don't just hang out here. Spend it time with the people actually doing the, the, the projects, you know, the field people installing the equipment, the, the people out there doing the work every day. 
Um, I would also, I guess if someone was going to follow in my footsteps, it would be a little bit above. It would be find the things you're interested in and learn a lot about them. Um, ask people questions. Find someone who knows more than you do and learn from them. Um, even when it's hard to network, you got to get out there and network because so much of your professional life is going to be about the network, the network that you have established and the people that you know. Um, and then follow through and, and do what you say you're going to do. And if there's if there's something that you want to do and it's not happening yet, then create that for yourself and kind of make yourself invaluable that way. Can I ask a follow-up question on networking? So networking, even though it's been fairly pushed um, for for professionals at this point, it's still something that's kind of a new concept. Can you explain what networking means to you and where you find the best relationships, what events that you go to or associations you join, so on and so forth? I am terrible at networking. I am <coughs> skipping over this question. <laughs> so I, I talked about this in my, my central sales team yesterday. We've gone to a regional approach. We have a pretty nice marketing budget for trade shows. And I told them, instead of looking at all these really big trade shows that we do every year, every state has a local association for a specific industry. <clears throat> maybe it's an air quality, maybe it's a concrete. These are really small shows, tabletop booths, but attend, join, uh, spend some time, become a volunteer to speak, meet the people at these, these regional events, get to know them, know, know, their, know their wife's name, know their kids. Uh, they'll know you, you know them, you get some industry expertise. That's on a, on a work level. On a personal level, just meet people and talk to them, ask them questions. I mean, you know, people love to, to, to talk about themselves. Let them do it. Ask them questions, learn something about them. Connect that person to something else. You know, just talking to these two a few minutes ago, we connected eight or nine people we knew. Yeah. And and mm -hmm. uh, and it, just do that. Ask questions. List. You do this. You went here. Did you know? Did you know? Do that connection game because there's you know the uncertainty reduction theory means that if if you if you're selling to somebody and you remind them like something connects them. You've got somebody you both know, and, and you can reference that. It's a reference for you, and it, and it helps tear down that wall. And these people are more comfortable with you. They'll buy from you, or they'll hire you, or they'll promote you. Um, they'll give you a reference. But connect to them some way or another on a personal level. Ask questions. Let them talk. And to the point that the networking's sort of new, there are, there are organizations who do it for you. So we're the Horse Country is a member of the Lexington Chamber of Commerce, and they have very regular programs that they put on. It might be a panel, it might be a workshop, and what it really is is an opportunity for you to go network with other people who are members of the chamber. And you might learn a little something too, but when you've left, you've maybe met four or five new people. And it, it doesn't have to be a formal networking night or something that's been labeled that way, but everything you show up for. Um, there are people who are in the business of planning these things on your behalf, so you can just attend them, you can learn something new, you can meet some new people. Um, and it's through those relationships that, that you all are going to find real meaning in your work. Um, and you never know. I mean, you get into an industry, and it's a small industry. Every industry is going to be very connected within itself. You get into a town. I mean, Lexington is not a big town. It's small. Things always circle back around. Um, so I think networking has a lot of different meanings, but the chamber is really good about it. Different, like he was saying, different like associations, well. LIPA, uh, maybe marketing associations. Um, when you have an opportunity to participate in anything that's already being planned, um, it's just a good way to show up. Everyone's in the same same boat. There, are, there's a very small percentage of the population who really likes showing up and, and really, really networking. You're all kind of there, going, "Hey." We're here to do this together, um, but it's a great opportunity. If the worst that happens is that you get new relationship or connections, then it's not a bad way to go out. So your answer kind of sounds like you still kind of feel awkward going into it, but you go anyways? Yeah. And you right. walk into a room sometimes, you don't know anybody in there. Yeah. It's a little awkward for a minute or two, but you just got to right. introduce yourself. And everybody there is expecting someone to right. introduce themselves to them, you know. Right. You're not at the bar picking somebody up, you know, you're out there at, you know, it's a, an organization where they're expecting you to talk, and, right. you know, versus a sales call. When you're selling on somebody, they don't necessarily want to get sold to that day. When you're at a networking event or an association event, they're expecting to ask, what do you do? What do you do? And yeah. connect things. Their, their guards down. Trade shows are that way, too. Yeah, and I would say building up, I'm terrible at networking, for real, um, but I would say building really good relationships with your coworkers helps with that, because a lot of times you'll have connections through people that you work with who have connections with completely different industries, who need somebody who knows the things that you do. 
Can you tell them what LIPA is? Lexington Young Professional Association. And they have happy hours, meetings, and some, you know, educational symposiums. It's maybe thirty dollars a year, if anything. It's fairly cheap. Um, and it's just an opportunity for people I'm probably too old for it now, but people right out of school join it and uh, start talking, what are you doing? You're doing this, I'm doing this. And you know, you get that first job and people are meeting and you learn about somebody else doing something else and hey, I've got an opening once you get to know them. That's networking. Uh, I mean, LinkedIn is networking. I mean, if you've got an interview with somebody or you're going to meet somebody, spend a minute and then look them up on, on LinkedIn or any of the social media platforms. Maybe you know somebody they know and it gives you something to talk about. Or if nothing else, you see a pop culture reference they put out on Facebook that you can relate to and bring up in conversation. Yeah, we all have, I mean, social media, we all have our own brands now. I mean, every one of us is a brand. And, and you know, you can learn a lot about someone you're going to meet that way. Advanced relationship. And you may, you may work for, you may find a job or find yourself in an organization that is already a member of the chamber or, or some other organization. And maybe they just haven't had someone who's said, hey, I'll go to this. So, so don't wait on your boss or your, your group leader or whatever to say, hey, I think you should go to this. If you see those opportunities, it's going to benefit, likely. It'll benefit the organization for you to be there, for you to be growing your skills, for you to be representing the organization. So I would also say, you know, don't, again, don't just wait for those things to come your way, but seek them out, see, see what might feel like a good fit or be a good place for you to go or see a friend going, ask if you can go to that. The chances are pretty good that your organization wants to be a part of those things. Um, and either they haven't taken the time or they're already investing in it and a new face there would be good. How many of y'all have a LinkedIn account? All right. So those that don't need to get your headshot taken today in the library. So do you all actively use your LinkedIn? You just got it. Okay. We had a workshop here. Don't put your picture on it. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> I mean, LinkedIn, I mean, in the sales world, we use it a lot. If you're going to make a call on, on a company, you Google that company, or you LinkedIn that company, you start finding these contacts. And, Rather than just calling a company, doing a cold call, and saying, "Who is the guy in charge of facility maintenance?" You can ask for a name, assume a relationship, they'll patch you through. It's, it's all it's completely different than back in the day when I went to the elevator just to fix plumbing today. I just cold call plumbing companies, and you know, it, it's there's a lot easier ways to get in there. Can you tell them what cold call is? Cold call. Okay, cold call is when you call some uh, an account up, you have no relationship, no contact. This is a sales uh, approach, and. Uh, you basically just dial in there and you give your value prop. You try to find out who the person is that you're selling to. Um, you get that contact. And maybe you get a meeting. Maybe you get hung up on. A lot of times you get hung up on. When I first started selling cell phones, uh, I could sell about one 100 phone calls. I got 50 bucks a phone. My rent was $600 a month. So I did the math. I knew how many phone calls I had to make that day. You know, if you do have any exactly how many calls you had to make for your success rate. And the more you did, the better you got. And it's, it's marketing. It's direct marketing. It's sales. Um, you're going to be selling ads for, for colleges or, 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 you know, you'll be doing a lot of cold calling. That's, it's a really good way to learn. It's frustrating because you get rejected a lot, but you just got to laugh at yourself. And uh, just have a, you know, get in a room with four or five people doing it and uh, laugh at each other when you fail. And then do the next one. Never put the phone down. And then that working business is so bad. Yeah. I, mean, <laughs> I went to college with a guy and he'd ask 100 girls out every night. And he usually had a girlfriend. And he was a very good looking guy. But, you know, he played the numbers. And it, and it worked, you know. And I, I use that when I teach my guys how to cold call. It's, it's, a, it's a numbers game. And yeah, based on the size of our school, I don't recommend that strategy. <laughs> fairly quickly. But there is something to be said for being able to deal with rejection. Because um, you get experience that way. Uh, when I worked for Swimming, the sponsorship sales director we hired uh, used to sell urinal ads. And you got to imagine you get rejected a lot when you go to a company, and I've got a perfect space to advertise your product. It's in a bathroom stall. <laughs> and that's what we did for six months. Captive audience. Was sold bathroom stall ads. I figured if he could sell that, he could probably sell our products without any problem. Yeah. You, know, you, you can calculate your, your close rate, too, on, on cold calls, or even proposals the amount. I mean, your pipeline is your active moving business, your opportunities, your proposals, your things that you could close. And that's something I track really closely with my sales team. As of yesterday, they were at 23% uh, win rate. 
And I can tell you that if I've got 100 million in the pipeline and I've got an average 23% win rate, then I'm going to close 23 million. So it's, you start understanding how much activity you got going, uh, how much you need to have going to, to, to hit your goals. And the sports analogy of that might be selling sponsorship for your state, or you're running an event and you're going to try to underwrite some of the cost. You're running a three on three tournament. How many outside sponsors do I need to have? to cover my facility costs so that we're just making profit off the teams that enter. And that gives you an idea of how many contacts you have to make. Or if you lose one, how much work you have to do to replace them. Because mm -hmm. sponsorships come up and they expire. Uh, we knew we had a sponsor, $20,000 a year sponsor that was going to expire and we had to replace them. But we didn't have anyone in the pipeline for that, so we had to find four $5,000 sponsors to replace that revenue. And you get to pay attention to those contracts, you know, when that runs out and get them, hit them early before somebody else hits them up and redo yeah. it, right? Make sure you're creating value. Yeah. Other questions? Uh, what majors do you pursue in graduate college? I've got an undergrad uh, uh, business, uh, it's a Bachelor of Science in Business, but emphasis on organizational communication and marketing that I did my MBA here. I have an English writing degree. I have a bachelor's in social work. It's funny though, after the first, depending on the field you go into, if it's a business field, after the first five to ten years, you have to stop asking about the degree as much. It's more about where you've been, what you've done. Yeah. You know, my, my father was a vice or a director of sales, and he had a radio and TV major. So it's kind of, once you get start getting that, you get in, you get that track record. My wife has a history major, she's been in sales for years. A really, really, really one of my best friends in the world. We, I've known her since I was in third grade. She is, she's been at the Cincinnati Reds now for 13 years, just for you all to take this away. She has had a lot of different roles. She's been the director of premium tickets. She's, she does a lot of the season ticket holder stuff, but she got her start because somebody asked her if she'd be willing to be the mascot of the License and Legends game, and she said, got nothing to lose and she did it and then she got several other positions through minor league and then landed at the Reds and has had a really great career there. It's, it's best I can tell. Uh, a lot of crazy stories. Um, she keeps getting promoted. It's been a really fun thing to watch her kind of grow in that sports management. So I think there's a, a big lesson. She always tells everyone that if her big piece of advice is just to say yes, like yes, I'll be the mascot because that opens some doors for her to do some other stuff. Um, as recently as six months ago, she got a promotion with the caveat that she also had to take over the all-you-can-eat eat hot dog bar, <laughs> and she was not happy about it. And there were some colorful texts that came through about it, but you know what? She did it because it was important to the people who were promoting her because they saw in her that she could help that program, um, and she's actually already up for another job change, and she's able to negotiate her way out of the hot dogs and into what she was hoping to get. So, you know, sometimes you've just you got to do the all-you-can-eat hot dogs so that you can get to that next step. Um, Never turn on a hot dog. <laughs> but, what was the hardest of building a job and to get to gain some skills and some gain some experience? The hardest one? The, like, the, the job that no one wanted to take to you to gain some skills. I worked as an executive secretary for a few months and that actually gave me my first window into my first professional marketing position because somebody that I was working with at the electric co-op where I was an executive secretary or administrative assistant, I guess it's more proper, um, but they were on the board at the nonprofit I ended up working for. I'm a, I'm a certified crane operator also because of my last organization. We, uh, OSHA was increasing and I was the general manager. I handled the sales, field service. All my crane operators weren't certified. A lot of these guys had not been in class or anything like that for years, and I needed to get them all certified. I had trouble getting their buy-in, so I, I made a bet with them that if I could do it, they'd have to do it with me. So I went out, and, you know, I go get them go to the gate class every day, and also uh, got certified to run a crane and could work on a job site. And I could close a two million dollar deal here, and then go actually run the crane. But I did that to get the buy-in from my people and get them to say they didn't think I could do it. They ran a crane for years. I'd never been in one, and I kind of challenged them if I could do it, you could do it. So they wouldn't do it with me. I've worked a lot with the general public, and that would give you a lot of skills that you need to deal with 
people and their feelings and their expectations. And I will, I will just leave it at that. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, you were kind of going on about talking about your employees that if I can do it, you can do it. Mm -hmm. I think. Is there any like advice to want that if you're a leader, how to get your employees to buy it more, or any advice just for leading in general? <clears throat> yeah, I mean, I was reading an article the other day that talked about you know technology and all these other things are kind of a, uh, take some of the skill sets that are traditionally valued in an organization are being diluted because it's being easier to do. Uh, emotional intelligence is something they talked about is is becoming a hugely important thing, and this is the ability to read people. This is uh, the ability to, to have to manage this person, you know, firmly, and you got to have these dates. You got to do this, and then this person got a little bit more of an ego, and you got to manage it. You got to do it a little bit differently. And it's the ability to read people and understand how they're reacting, what they're, they're you know, how they're going to react after you walk away from it. Getting them to do things, finding out what triggers them. I mean, it's similar when you sell to people. Also, you you know, they've got a business goal, but you need to think about what's their personal goal, what's important to them. Um, that's what I try to think about, you know, when I'm negotiating, what's their motivation, what's my motivation, how do we get there? You know, if I'm selling you something and your goal is to save, you know, 10% for the company, but in reality, the machine I'm selling, it's the machine you're currently running goes down on Saturday nights and you play softball and a lot of times you're getting called in and having to miss softball. I would sell it in a way that talks to you not having to, you know, come in when you're doing other things. So it's, it's understanding someone's motivation and triggering them for that. Selling them on the idea, not telling them the idea, explaining to them why it's important. You know, it's not just important to me, this is what's going to affect you. So build more than just like a understand them as a person more and build a better relationship now. Yeah, it's a relationship and, and, and not not so much telling, more selling, even though people work for you, you don't think you have to. I would say um, in, in my leadership style, a lot of it's figuring out what the person who you're working with or who's working for you is interested in and then helping build those skills, even if, if it's unrelated to their job, because if you get their buy-in that way and you're helping build their skills, then they're going to be willing to work at the hot dog stand. Mm -hmm. And everybody who works for you should lead you way better than they came in. I think always, I, I, I think it's a really baseline level of like, you can learn from everyone. Like nothing is wasted. If you're in, on a team with someone, whether you're the leader or not, you can leave with them. And I, I, I think when I think about the leaders that I've worked for that have really made a meaningful impact on me, I think about the people who it never felt like they were the leader necessarily, but that we were doing more collaborative. And then when, when the big decisions came or the hard things or was it just the seniority, when it came to that, maybe they were the leader, but it, it never felt like there was like a discrepancy in, in how valuable my input was or, or what my place was or my role. What's the most surprising thing about your role that you were not expecting? Yeah. <laughs> this, this will be the last. Uh, not talking about what time of day it is and how many different surprising <laughs> things. Um, uh, we're, we're a public trading company, so it's always interesting when we do our quarterly earnings. When we think it's good and, and it goes bad, or we think this is going to be really bad, and Way Wall Street answers ask the question or ask us the questions and how it triggers what they read into when you're dealing with market analysts. It's always surprising. Bookings are down, but they like this, and your stock goes up 20 percent. Or you thought you had a much better quarter, and you went down 10 percent. Reading the market is pretty surprising. I've run social media in every job I've ever had, and I would say the most surprising thing is the way that people interact. What you put out on social. Um, we have a lot of alumni who interact uh, very heavily with our Facebook page, and sometimes if it's the least interesting thing you would think that they care about. There's one person who comments on a lot of our Throwback Thursday posts about the size of the trees in the photo, whether that tree really grew since they went here, or oh, look how small that tree was back in such and such year, um, or the questions that we get on Facebook. Um, they're all very far-reaching and out of nowhere. The public, <laughs> yes. I would agree. I think, and I think when you interact with people and you don't know where they're coming from, and everyone has their own story, and everyone is interacting with your brand from a different perspective, or they arrived at your Facebook page or your email in a different way, um, 
I think I think it's just sometimes it's delightful how surprising it can be when you're working with the general public. Um, I would say in this role, I had lived in Lexington and then moved away and then came back, and so to be able to work in this in this role where we're promoting, and it's a good time to be in tourism. Did you all watch Top Chef Kentucky? Anyone? <laughs> okay, right. Um, but the state of Kentucky, the state tourism department is doing a lot. They're investing a lot to bring in people uh, to spend their dollars here and to help boost the economy. Visit Lex, um, the Louisville tourism, the things going on at Woodford County right now, everything regionally. There's just a big push because we have a lot of great stuff going on in Kentucky. We have courses, we have bourbon, we have um, athletics, we have all these great things to showcase. And there's a big push. And it has been just really delightful how how people have embraced Kentucky as a destination. Um, and I think that's one of my big takeaways right now is that we're not some obscure spot on the map in the South, but not really. Um, you know, I've been to these international, these shows for international travelers, and they say, well, we've done New York, we've done Disney, we've done California, now we want to see real America. We want to see what it's really like to live in the South. So we're coming to Kentucky and what can you show us? And that's that's really neat. Like as someone who grew up here and someone who moved back because it's home and this is where I want to be, um, it's been really fun to, to share that story. All right. Do you all have any last bits of wisdom to share with your next generation of individual coworkers or clients or contacts? I'd say when you graduate, um, Pick an industry or a company you really like, maybe not the job at that company you really like, but get into the industry or the company you like. And honestly, within six months to a year, you'll probably get promoted if you're doing the right thing. That first job doesn't matter as much as the company you're with. And, and you know, learn everything you can about the industry. You might find yourself in an industry you don't care anything about the product, but that's hard to get passionate about. So spend time focusing on, on the industry and possibly you know, where you want to live, where you want to be, because you may end up there a long time and take that first job. It's pretty important. And then, you know, move around, bounce around, uh, take those opportunities for, for advancement when you're young because it gets a little harder. Settle, you have kids, wife has a job. So do those things early. I would disagree. I, uh, I went into automotive having absolutely zero cares about vehicles other than that I could drive one and it didn't break down. And I loved the automotive industry. It's very fast paced. It was way different than I anticipated. There's marketing jobs with the CIA and the FBI, and there's there's so many different ways that you can apply your skills across the entire world in a wide multitude of industries. So just apply to what sounds interesting and see if you can get in the door. I mean, if it's something that you've never considered before, that's fine because you might really, really want to there. Um, I, I think I would just say fine find some other things other than your professional life to stay interested in. Um, reading and podcasts are huge for me right now just to stay sort of curious about what's going on in the world and to hear advice from other people and to hear how working moms are managing their career and their life and their home life or to hear about how people of faith kind of work in the workplace or whatever. So I, I would just say your job is important and it's a thing, but it's not the only thing. And when I when I go back to and think about those people in my life who've been really good leaders for me, they've all had a life outside of work and they've managed a way to find some boundaries. And maybe there's a season where you work all the time, or maybe there's a job where you work more than other time, and that's part of what you signed up for. But um, probably sitting here today at this point in my life and my career, I would say I love my job and it's a whole lot of fun and that's the days that we do really good things are better than the days that are hard. Um, but big picture, I have some other stuff going on that keeps me balanced, and, and I think that's a really important part of your career, too. No one likes the guy in the office who only is at the office all the time, right? Like, i, I got to know you've got another part of your life out there. The people that talk about how busy they are probably the least busy people you know. <laughs> well, that's a whole other seminar. <laughs> Quick question. What are your thoughts on... You know, a lot of times we hear follow your passion, right? And it's all about passion, but you know, there's bound there's there's two different aspects to like your passion or what you're actually good at. Yeah. You know, in terms of starting a career, sometimes if you actually <laughs> take advantage of what you're good at, you know, is there what are your thoughts on that? Is there an overlap or should the, should you follow one over the other? Or? I would say find a way to make what you're good at apply to the things that you're interested in. I'm good at making things pretty. 
and I can apply that to almost anything. So if you're good at storytelling, find somewhere that you can do that. If you're good at taking photos, find somewhere that needs a photographer. It doesn't matter if you're taking pictures of babies or if you're taking pictures of architecture, as long as you're happy in what you're doing. Apply your skills to what you like. I've, I've sold you know, a couple different products, but I, the products I sell now are, are air quality, clean air, environmental. I really like that because it's actually something that I could articulate a story behind and think about my kids, my grandkids down the road that maybe I'm doing something. And I sold cell phones and things like that early on. That I, I, yeah, I sold them and I did well with them, but I didn't have that story. I didn't have that backdrop that helped me with my elevator pitch and something that I, I like getting behind. It makes me a little bit happier knowing I'm selling something that I'm making money at, but I can also do something that helps the world down the road. I think there's room for a balance with it. I, I, I talked about the hustle culture earlier, and I think there's a tendency right now to think that you can monetize everything you've ever loved and turn it into a job. And I, I, Maybe I'm old school, but I don't know that that's necessarily true or productive for people to do. Um, and maybe it's just a sign of the times that that's what we're, what we're doing. I, I think that if you are in a job that is just a job, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be a real drag, and you're going to have a long sad career. Uh, so I think I think somehow mixing something that you're interested in, something that can keep you interested, somewhere where there's a lot of room to grow. I mean, if you're in marketing, any industry is going to evolve. The platforms we're using, the ways that we market to people, the way we tell our stories is going to just keep evolving. So if the subject matter is interesting to you at some level, or there's a layer of it that can stay interesting to you, I think that that's an important component of it. Um, but I, I think there's a balance with like, Oh, this is my passion, so I'm going to The hardest thing you'll find after you get into an industry is possibly taking a pay cut to do something different. You may hate what you're doing, but you don't want to take that pay cut. That's probably not permanent, that pay cut. Yeah. Uh, but it's definitely worth it sometimes. If you want to make a change and you hate what you're doing 40 hours a week, you know, take a little pay cut and do something different, and uh, it'll, it'll build back up. Well, thank you all, uh, guests, very much for coming today. If we can give them a hand, I really appreciate it. You guys are awesome.